a radioactive steam geyser at San Onofre? Just when you thought you'd heard every possible danger associated with those five-eighths inch thin-walled storage canisters, each containing fuel rods laced with plutonium and a Chernobyl's worth of radioactivity, buried only 108 feet from the Pacific Ocean in an earthquake tsunami zone within 50 miles of 8 million people, and a nuclear engineer with 50 years' experience in the field tells you, If there is a storm surge or a tsunami, what happens is it will cover the tops of this uh, radioactive fuel, which sits there. Inside the hole is about 450 degrees, and if water gets in there, we know what happens when you put water onto 450-degree metal. uh, It will immediately flash the steam. When the water gets in there due to flooding, the steam will be forced out the top and the cold water could actually cause the rupture of the cans that allegedly contain the many, many tons of nuclear fuel. A possible radioactive Yellowstone geyser on the Southern California coast? Who knew? Well, it's just another way to learn that we're sitting ducks stuck in that dangerous seat that we all share. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we learn about the possibility of a radioactive steam geyser happening at the San Onofre Nuclear Power Station on the Pacific Coast in Southern California. We talk with Paul Blanche, a nuclear engineer with half a century of experience working in all aspects of the nuclear industry, and he offers yet another nightmare scenario for the thin-walled canisters holding highly radioactive waste right there on the beach. Let's hope the surf is not up. We also get reminded of how any one of us can fight back against nuclear weapons by hearing from Susie Snyder of the Netherlands-based group Don't Bank on the Bomb. It's a grassroots strategy to starve the nuclear industry of its favorite fuel, money. One bank account, one pension fund at a time, and any one of us can participate. We will also have... Nuclear news from around the world, numbnuts of the week for outstanding nuclear boneheadedness, and more honest nuclear information than we've heard from anywhere since the coronavirus justifiably hijacked international health worries and concerns. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, March 3, 2020, and here is this week's nuclear news from a different perspective. Starting off in Japan, where radiation disinformation and human rights violations are at the heart of Fukushima and the Olympic Games. This, according to an article by Sean Burney of Greenpeace. He writes, Ignoring basic scientific principles of radiation protection, the government of Japan is deliberately distorting reality on actual contamination, the limited effectiveness and scope of decontamination, and risks in Fukushima Prefecture. Abe's, meaning Prime Minister Abe's, disinformation narrative on Fukushima is aimed at erasing the image of Fukushima as the location of one of the world's nuclear disasters, and by so doing, reviving the prospects for the nation's nuclear industry. Many of the issues concern the rights of evacuees, particularly women and children. 
It's an excellent article which looks at the entire issue of Japan, radiation, and the Olympics through the perspective of the United Nations. And we will have a link to it up on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 454. The Olympic torch relay, set to begin on March 26, only weeks from now, faces resistance from nuclear evacuees, many of whom are publicly chafing over the government's efforts to showcase the town of Futaba, right next to the remains of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power station and triple meltdown. Focus on the town of Futaba as a shining example of Fukushima reconstruction for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. While construction crews have been repairing streets and decontaminating the center of town as best possible, they are only working on a very small portion of the town. One former resident who is an evacuee, Yuji Onuma, said he hoped the torch relay would also pass through the overgrown and ghostly parts of town to convey everything that the 7,100 residents uprooted from Futaba lost as a result of the accident. He said, I don't think people will understand anything by just seeing cleaned up tracts of land, which does seem to be what the Japanese government wants. The foreign ministry is also pushing back against the Japan Confederation of A-bomb and H-bomb sufferers organizations, which is slated to mount an exhibit during the review conference for the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty at the United Nations from April 27 to May 22. The foreign ministry has pushed for all references to the Fukushima nuclear disaster to be removed from that exhibition and has suggested it could withdraw its backing unless the requested changes are made. This according to Suiichi Kido, the group's general secretary. The exhibition in the lobby of UN headquarters in New York will consist of around 50 panels, mainly describing the horrors of nuclear weapons, including the aftermath of the 1945 atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Suiichi Kido said, Atomic bombs and nuclear accidents are the same in the sense that they cause harm through radiation. In its full-court pro-nuclear press, Japan has indicated that any future trade deal with Britain would be reliant upon food import restrictions imposed after the Fukushima nuclear disaster being dropped. While in the EU, Britain was part of a comprehensive trade deal with Japan, but now that it is separated, thanks to Brexit, will have to develop new trade agreements. The EU eased some import regulations last year, but still insists on inspections and certificates of origin for some Japanese produce, including seafood. Here in the U.S., in Colorado, elected leaders in Broomfield, Colorado, signaled that the city plans to withdraw from the organization overseeing the planned $250 million Jefferson Parkway, which is planned to run adjacent to Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge, a.k.a. Rocky Flats Radioactive Superfund site, where plutonium pits were manufactured. Indeed, Broomfield cited elevated readings of plutonium discovered last summer in the proposed path of the highway and next to the wildlife refuge as the chief reason behind its decision to withdraw. As one councilman said, After that soil sample, I think it would be irresponsible to move forward with this alignment. And Broomfield can refuse to allow that proposed tollway within its borders. In Oregon, two and a half million pounds of radioactive waste from fracking have been illegally dumped in an Oregon landfill near the Columbia River. Dan Ceres from Columbia Riverkeeper, a watchdog group, said... The radioactive material has been brought into the state and illegally disposed of in violation of our rules. It seems unacceptable that Oregon can be used as a radioactive fracking waste dump for three years. Lots of details here. We will link to it on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under episode number 354. Up to Canada where Ontario ice cream maker Chapman's says that the proposal to bury nuclear waste in the Great Lakes Basin is short-sighted. 
and placing the nation's stockpile of spent nuclear fuel in the province's agricultural heartland doesn't do the dairy industry any favors. Yeah, think? Now that there will be no deep geological repository on the shores of Lake Huron, there are two potential sites in Ontario being considered, one of them only an hour northeast of Chapman's manufacturing headquarters. Ashley Chapman, vice president of Chapman's Ice Cream, said, To think that we could have a nuclear waste dump in such a strategically important processing area for dairy is just silly. This despite suggestions for new flavors of ice cream, rad waste ripple, and cesium chip, but no plutonium. That's too hot and the ice cream would not freeze. In Indonesia, still no explanation about the radiation that showed up in a housing complex in South Tangerang. But the National Nuclear Energy Agency has asked residents to remain calm after finding high levels of radiation within the complex. An agency spokesperson said locals should not panic because the case was being handled by the relevant authorities. In the U.K., Trident submarine commanders have been told that they are not responsible under law for their actions should they launch a nuclear attack. We'll link to this one because the double talk and obfuscation is jaw-dropping. And now... Nuclear hot seat Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none that's out week. Got too much radioactive waste hanging around? Hey, just dump it in the nearest large body of water, preferably an ocean. That's what they say they're going to do with the radioactive water from Fukushima Daiichi over in Japan. And now, here comes England. The UK's Ministry of Defense is planning to increase discharges of radioactive waste into the Firth of Clyde, pristine coastal waters off Scotland, by up to 50 times. The waste comes from the Royal Navy's submarines and from the processing of Trident nuclear warheads. According to the Ministry of Defense, the proposed discharges were within permissible limits. Yeah? Who gave permission? And who gave them permission to give permission? The Clyde Base's naval commander said that proposed annual limits for discharges were being reduced where practical. What does that even mean? He also said there would be no radiological hazard for any member of the public. Nobody can promise that. Nobody. And that's why. UK Ministry of Defense, you are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of the week. We'll have this week's featured interviews in just a moment. But first, the coronavirus is frightening, and it's been taking over the news cycle with good reason. It's an invisible invader, a threat to everyone's health and life. So small you can't see it, smell it, hear it, taste it, or touch it, as it spreads rapidly to eventually threaten human life around the planet. Sound like anything else? Yep, put that way, it sounds an awful lot like nuclear radioactivity. But here's the thing. As bad as COVID-19 already is and may become, it will ultimately pass, either die out on its own, mutate into something hopefully less damaging, our immune systems will be able to fight it off or develop immunity, or it will be knocked out by a vaccine. We should all be able to afford one. Nuclear radioactivity, on the other hand, will be with us forever. And right now, it seems that nobody in the media is covering it, let alone with any urgency or consistency. That's why there's nuclear hot seat. Knowledge is power, and every week we bring you the international nuclear news, expert interviews, insights, and perspective, delivered with as much humor as possible. But we need your help to keep getting you the nuclear information that you have come to rely upon. So when you finish washing your hands and stocking up for possible quarantine, help us out with this other threat to human life and safety, the nuclear one. Nuclear Hot Seat is dependent upon donations to meet our monthly expenses. 
So help us now by going to NuclearHotSeat.com and clicking on the big red Donate button. Know that however much you can help, I am deeply grateful that you're listening and that you care. Here's the first of this week's two featured interviews. A few weeks ago, the Southern California Nuclear Watchdog Group, Public Watchdogs, issued a shocking press release stating that flooding was likely to create radioactive geysers at the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. They made a legal filing with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, backing it with scientific evidence. So what exactly are they talking about here? That's why we contacted Paul Blanche. He's the engineer, the nuclear engineer, who researched and advised on this public watchdog's finding. As you will hear, he has more than 50 years of experience in the nuclear industry and has a lot to say to back up this newly exposed nuclear nightmare. Paul Blanche, thank you for joining us on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. I'm glad to be a guest on Nuclear Hot Seat. Let's start out with a little bit about your background and the nature of your work with public watchdogs. Hey, my background is I'm a professional engineer and I've worked about 55 years in the nuclear industry, primarily on the commercial power side. I'm a veteran of the United States Navy. I used to teach and operate nuclear reactors, and I'm very, very familiar with all aspects of the technical and regulatory responsibilities of nuclear power, and now it's nuclear waste. And with respect to the public watchdogs, I'm a uh, expert advisor to public watchdog on nuclear waste for San Onofre. The idea of a radiation geyser being a possibility at San Onofre is a new idea. First of all, what would a radiation geyser be and where did that idea come from? Well, the idea originated with public watchdogs. They came up with it and they said, it, Paul, is this a possibility? And I did a lot of research, many weeks of research with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission documentation and various analysis and uh, flood analysis and tsunami analysis and found out that, yes, in fact, it is a distinct possibility that the area where they've located these, which is below ground, but the top sits above ground, is a flood area, according to sworn documents submitted to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission by Southern Cal Edison. So if there is a storm surge or a tsunami, what happens is it will cover the tops of this uh, radioactive fuel, which sits there at, in excess while well, the fuel itself is close to 800 degrees, but inside the hole is about 450 degrees. And if water gets in there, we know what happens when you put water onto 450 degree metal, uh, it will immediately flash the steam. When a water gets in there due to flooding, the steam will be forced out the top and the cold water could actually cause the rupture of the cans that allegedly contain the nuclear fuel, the 200 tons or more, whatever the number is. It's many, many tons of nuclear fuel. Why has this concept not surfaced before? Well, it's not surfaced before because San Onofre is the only plant in the world that I'm aware of that uses this concept of burying the high-level nuclear waste in the ground right at the surface. Other plants throughout the country, throughout the world, either store it well above ground or it's contained within a building. As I say, San Onofre is very unique and that the California Coastal Commission determined we don't want to see these, so let's bury them and out of sight, out of mind. But uh, what they didn't realize is they created a major, major problem. And this is 72 different silos that could simultaneously act as a geyser. We don't know how high that geyser would uh, run, but what we are demanding is that they do an analysis or test to demonstrate 
what will actually happen should that flood as predicted. And as listeners to this program know, we use the equivalency that was developed through SanOnofreSafety.org and Donna Gilmore that each canister contains a Chernobyl's worth of radioactivity. So uh, that would be 72 potential Chernobyls happening in geyser form on the coast. Yeah, that is possible, but I don't think anyone's claiming that we're going to release that all that radiation. Only a part of it would be released. And I don't want to panic all the people that we're going to have 72 Chernobyls, but we could have 72 geysers emitting radioactive material that would cause an area, I don't know how large an area, to become uninhabitable for generations. What can be done about this problem? What can possibly mitigate it? Well, as you know, I communicate with John Gilmore, and we're in sync with our position here, is that this fuel has to be removed from its present location in the ground, put back into the spent fuel pool, and then design, not design, but use thick-walled canisters that can withstand these types of events until we can find a permanent location. What we have now here is nothing more than soup cans or garbage cans holding the most deadly substance on Earth, and that's not an exaggeration. What has been the response that you know of to this announcement and the petition by public watchdogs to the NRC to look into and examine and do something about this situation? Well, first of all, the NRC has not responded to this. It's going to take them a while. I've filed petitions before on other plants, and obviously uh, the NRC has the interests of the utility Southern Cal Ed as their primary objective to keep them economically viable. So they're going to try to reject it and discredit me. In fact, the public relations people wrote a letter claiming all my information was false that I put out. I wrote back to them uh, this morning, which I can send you a copy of. It refutes what they said. They absolutely distorted the facts. They did not use the information that is in the final safety analysis report submitted by themselves and by the dry cast manufacturer. So we have solid evidence that there's a high likelihood that this could occur should there be a flood for whatever reason. Do you live anywhere near San Onofre? I live about 2,500 miles away from San Onofre. I'm in Connecticut. I'm a lot closer than that. Is there any aspect of this you can think of that you haven't spoken of that you would like to add at this time? We fully expect the NRC to get back to public watchdogs and try to throw out the petition on some technicality. We will have conferences, telephone conferences with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. It will take them years until they can find a way to reject our petition. They will never accept it. Uh, The NRC's primary mission is not safety. Their primary mission is the viability of the nuclear industry, and they don't want to do any harm. There have been, I've submitted in my lifetime, maybe eight petitions, and everyone's been rejected over the last 30 years. Maybe 400 petitions have been submitted to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and every one of them has been rejected. So it's a way to get attention. We know it's going to be rejected for some BS reasoning that will have no engineering validity, but uh, at least we will make them aware that we are watching them. And if you lived closer to San Onofre, as I and, of course, 8 million people do within a 50-mile radius, what would you suggest? I would suggest that the public get out there and demand they put all the spent fuel in thick-walled canisters like used in Europe and Japan, and that will assure safety for maybe 50 or 100 years. Right now, there's no assurance. And it's like an earthquake could occur. We could have this occur. 
you know, the people in California are in danger. I mean, people live there. They tolerate the risk of this Yellowstone geyser phenomenon. Well, I think they're tolerating this particular risk because they haven't been aware of it. And my gratitude to public watchdogs and to you for bringing this forward. Well, thank you very much. I certainly enjoy identifying safety issues in the nuclear field and other fields and uh, commitment to safety that keeps me going. Paul Blanche, thank you so much for being my guest on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. Paul Blanche, a nuclear engineer with 50 years of experience in the nuclear industry and a subject matter expert with public watchdogs in Southern California. You can learn more by going to their website, publicwatchdogs.org. And that's plural, watchdogs. Now for our second interview, and it's with one of my favorite international activists, Susie Snyder is project lead for the Pax No Nukes Project and coordinates the Don't Bank on the Bomb research and campaign. She's an expert on nuclear weapons with over two decades of experience working at the intersection between nuclear weapons and human rights. We spoke originally last year when Don't Bank on the Bomb had just published their 2018 global report on the financing of nuclear weapons producers. They publish a report annually, and the new one will be coming out soon, but I just couldn't wait to share her information with you again. She and her website provide a blueprint for how we can leverage money out of the nuclear weapons industry. We spoke on Friday, May 10, 2019. Note that there will be a brief, unplanned appearance of a young activist who underscores the reason why we do this work. Susie Snyder. Thank you so much for being with us here today on Nuclear Hot Seat. Great to be here. Thanks so much. First of all, what is PAX and what are the organization's goals? Well, PAX is a Dutch peace organization. And what we're doing, we are working to reduce uh, human suffering as a result of conflict. Um, and so to, to prevent war, prevent suffering, uh, and generally to, to make sure that we build norms that keep people safe and keep people alive. What are some of your cornerstone programs? I'm certainly familiar with Don't Bank on the Bomb because I have followed that protocol with my own finances. What is this and how can people participate in it? Don't Bank on the Bomb is a great project um, that is, what we do is we, we do three things. We examine the impact of the financial sector on companies that produce nuclear weapons. We name those companies, name them and shame them. And we encourage people to get in touch with their financial institutions so that they develop policies so that they don't have any exposure to these companies that do produce the key components for nuclear bombs. So it's, it's naming the ones that have investments, it's supporting the ones that have great policies not to invest, and it's, of course, identifying the companies that make the bombs, because if we don't know who's doing it, we don't know what we can do about it. Speaking of those companies, there has just been a new report that came out naming 28 separate companies as being involved in the manufacture of nuclear weapons. How did that report come about, and what are some of the findings you've made because of it? Well, let me tell you, Libby, it was a good deal of research, and we are extremely rigorous in our research. So we've been looking at contracts and announcements for contracts, requests for proposals, and so on for the last, uh, for the last six months. Um, and so what we did is, as we looked at these, we looked at these different issues, and we, sorry, sorry, I, I'm no. sure that many of your listeners also have children. <laughs> and it's so they're hearing in the background. <laughs> Susie, this is the reason we do the work that we do for the children and beyond. So this could not be more perfect. it is just the reality you know working moms everywhere um anyway so what we did is um we looked at the contracts we looked at the the government plans different government plans for new types of nuclear weapons for the weapons that are 
under these so-called modernization programs. And then we look to see, okay, who's actually doing this in-house, so to speak? Like what, what countries are doing it? There's only nine countries that have nuclear weapons, right? It's not so many at the end of the day. And we look at who does stuff in-house using state-run agencies and who contracts out. Now, not everybody contracts out. Russia does stuff mostly in-house. Uh, North Korea does everything in-house. Pakistan does stuff in-house, but India, um, the US, the UK, France, they all, con they all hire external contractors. So then we follow the money. Who bids on the contracts? Who gets the contracts? And what are they doing? What are they actually doing under these contracts? And that's where we found exciting, well, it's exciting in a, in not a nice way, <laughs> to be honest. It's, but we found that, you know, we found over $116 billion in existing contracts right now for keeping nuclear weapons on the planet. And some of them until 2075, which all of these countries have said, the heads of state at one time or another said, no, we need a world without nuclear weapons. And I'll tell you, you don't get to a world without nuclear weapons by hiring Boeing or Raytheon or Lockheed Martin to build a new nuclear arsenal for you. Some of the stories that I've read about coming out from the contracts are Truly, it's like going into bizarro land. Uh, give us some examples. For example, when the head of Raytheon was asked if there was a growth opportunity in the U.S. exit from the INF Treaty. So this is really surprising. I mean, okay, usually with nuclear weapons, nobody's really, at least nobody should be really proud to be making nuclear weapons. These are weapons designed to, you know, your listeners will know this already. These are weapons designed to annihilate cities. They're not for battlefields. They're not for strategic pinpoint accuracy. This is a city buster. And that's, I think that's really important to keep in mind. And for the most part, over the last, almost the last generation, people have been shying away from, from taking pride in this, but then there are a few. Um, and there's been a slight change in the rhetoric around this. So when you know, Donald Trump took office, he asked these questions, why would we have nuclear weapons if we could never use them? And he started saying, well, maybe we need, you know, we need to go back to make more and the biggest and the best weapons. Um, and he's basically inciting an arms race by withdrawing from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, this treaty from 1987 that prohibited an entire class of weapons, he opened the floodgates on this. And so in Raytheon, and Raytheon of all companies, Raytheon kind of was getting out of the nuclear arms game. It was seen as a, as a losing interest. But then the withdrawal from the INF came about and they said, oh, wait, we might have an opportunity here, at least in the short term. So you, you saw the investor relations call. They said they were asked the question, oh, yeah, you know, is there any opportunity for us? And over the next quarter, Raytheon got $500 million and new contracts related to missile technology. Um, so Raytheon's starting to cash in on this new nuclear arms race, and I just have to ask the question, what are they, you know, they're only looking for short-term game. What are they looking for in the long term? Because this is not the kind of product that we should be supporting. It's a terrifying thought that nuclear weapons are looked at as a growth industry and an opportunity for investor profits when really their end game is the destruction of everything and their profits will mean nothing. There are other programs that have been brought up in the reading that I've been doing. And another one had to do with Boeing and a new program that the company that brought us the twice crashed 737 MAX is being asked to develop. What is a flight termination receiver and what are the implications of the attempt to develop it? Okay, so this is something that within the nuclear policy community, there's some debate, right? So the flight termination receiver is, the idea is you, you can call the missile back because it takes about, it takes between 25 and 40 minutes for an intercontinental ballistic missile to be launched and hit its target. And that means that once you press the button, there's, there's two hours until the end of civilization as we know it, because any target, they're going to they're gonna see the incoming missile and they're going to launch in return. They're going to try to take everything out before you take out what they've got. That's the whole, that's, there was this whole concept behind mutually assured destruction. So with what Boeing is doing now is they're making this new missile technology so that if you launch 
and you decide, oh, wait, whoops, our, our information was wrong. Oh, actually, it was a weather balloon. Oh, no, that wasn't an incoming missile. It was, you know, it was a pigeon. You, whatever it is, and I, I don't mean to make light of it, but seriously, what, there's been so many near misses. It could be anything. The idea is that the missile would then go off course or would, or would self-destruct. So it wouldn't have the same, um, it wouldn't hit its target. So the idea is to be able to, to shift it in flight. Now, on the one hand, you know, this could be great because then it, you know, it won't hit its target and you could, you could stop some insanity. But on the other hand, if you see the missile coming in, you're going to fire with everything you've got. And so it's a losing situation. It's a losing proposition. And honestly, as you said, Ruby, I mean, how much can we trust Boeing right now? It's how much do we trust anybody who is working in nuclear arms because they can somehow justify it. I've also seen that one of the problems with having a flight termination receiver is that it might call for a launch of a weapon and then using it just as a scare tactic because they think, well, we can pull it back and there will be no harm, no foul, when indeed, you're right, the retaliation could be volleyed out before we could pull it back and they might not be able to do so and there goes the planet or if not the planet at least the people and the life forms on it exactly and what we've learned from new climate research from new modeling over the, just the last 10 years is that it doesn't take a thousand bombs going off to destroy the civilization that we that we know it would take a hundred weapons between for example india and pakistan and two billion people, two billion people would be at risk of famine. It would cause grave environmental catastrophe. It would, it would be a nuclear winter. And in the 80s, we were totally aware of this. We're like, okay, this is not going to happen. We're going to stop it. We're going to shut this down. This is insane. And right now, it's our time to stand up and say, hey, this is insane. There are so many more things that we could spend the money on. The U.S. government alone is spending $70,000 a minute on producing nuclear weapons. $70,000 a minute. Imagine what $70,000 a minute could do for public education, addressing climate change. The nuclear weapons problem, it's complicated, but it's, it's a relatively easy fix. And... It's just a matter of deciding to do it. And now's the time for people to, to demand that we do. You know, you're right. On the one hand, it's a terribly depressing image for those of us who oppose nuclear and have managed to become conscious about it. Yet, in the intertwining of the private sector and nuclear weapons, there are potential points of leverage. Explain what you mean by that. This is what's, what I'm finding is very exciting. So two years ago, most of the, the nations in the world adopted a new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. They said, you know what? This has gone bonkers long enough, and the consequences of any use of nuclear weapons are so grave, we need to prohibit everything to do with them. Prohibit all the making, having, using, preparing to use, pro prohibit it. Make it illegal. Make sure that we are collectively responsible if any weapons get used you know, reinforce the non-proliferation standard by doing so. Protect the environment. This is so most governments in the world said, yes, we're going to do this. And after that, financial institutions, banks, pension funds, insurance companies, they said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If the weapons are illegal, the companies that are making the weapons, they're going to start to go down. Let's get out. Let's get out now. Let's prevent any reputational risk or regulatory risk. Let's end our financial involvement with these companies. And 10% of them dropped out. It was amazing. When you said 10% of them dropped out, explain a little more about what that exactly means. We've been doing this kind of analysis of the involvement of the financial sector and nuclear weapon producers for, for a while now, since 2013. And we track every year how many, how many banks and how many financial institutions invest. And from the adoption of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons until a year later, there was a 10% reduction. There's, it's, 
in actual numbers, there's 30 fewer financial institutions that had investments in the companies that produce nuclear weapons. And some of these are, are really, like this is Blue Cross and Blue Shield that previously had some investments and then got out. This is, you know, the Norwegian government pension funds that said, oh, wait a minute, we, we better change our relationship here. This is ABP, which is the fifth largest pension fund in the world. And they said, oh, hang on. Nope, nuclear is illegal now. Got to get out of that game, which is quite impressive. And we're putting together the numbers for this year. And I think we're going to see some, some additional positive change. There's, nope, even though a few companies are starting to make money off of new contracts, in most of the world, this is seen as a bad investment. I often think of PACS and the Nobel Peace Prize winning international campaign for the abolition of nuclear weapons, or ICANN, which was behind the treaty in the United Nations, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. I often think of you two as kind of either conjoined or somehow being under the same umbrella. What is the relationship between the two groups? PACS is a partner of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. And ICANN is a campaign coalition, and we've got over 500 partners in more than 100 countries around the world. And it was ICANN working with these partnerships, also with with concerned governments, with international organizations like the the Global Red Cross that got this treaty to happen. It was was through partnership. It was through a movement. And PACS is a a part of this bigger movement. We're really proud to be a member of this campaign coalition because it means that we're, as we said in the, the local papers here, the Nobel Peace Prize got won in our little town, at least a little bit. It's quite amazing. Let's switch over to talking a little bit about ICANN and the impact that that is having and can potentially have on the entire nuclear weapons landscape in the world. It is not a campaign to ask the nine nuclear countries to get rid of their weapons. It's a campaign to get all of the countries that don't have nuclear weapons to agree to not get nuclear weapons. And then there are other provisions involved with it as well. Can you explain what those are and how those would mess up the nuclear countries? Sure. So the thing is with with ICANN is that we're working in over 100 countries to raise the stigma against nuclear weapons. And most countries of the world have already rejected nuclear weapons. It's just this nine that are seem to be a bit stuck and seem to be kind of a, I don't know, it's a little bit of old thinking and that doesn't quite relate to the current world order. But the ICANN is working even in the nuclear armed countries to say, hey, we have a plan to get to no nuclear weapons in the world. We know the nuclear armed countries, they're clearly not ready yet. They haven't quite matured to the level of, of many others to be able to, to take a more realistic and pragmatic approach to their security but the other countries have. And so countries like Austria and Ireland, South Africa, are fully on board with this treaty because they recognize that there is no no benefit to them and only risk from supporting nuclear weapons. What this means is that financial institutions in those countries have seen what happens with other weapons prohibitions and they get out of the of the game when it comes to to investing in companies that produce the weapons companies like airbus airbus is a com- is a dutch registered company airbus has operations throughout europe airbus is known for making airplanes airbus also makes missiles for the french nuclear arsenal and what this does is it says that if you, if airbus for example when germany signs on to the ban treaty The operations that Airbus has within Germany can't be involved in the production of missiles for France or for anybody else, because that's prohibited under the treaty. And that would change the landscape for France. France doesn't have another capability or that they have to move manufacturing capabilities. And that's, that's really important. And also, the treaty also has this great impact because it makes the question of, it challenges the assumption that nuclear weapons benefit anyone's security. And in fact, puts the onus on those who have the weapons, prove it. You've been saying this for so long with no evidence. You've been you know, quite hysterical about your security concerns. No, be rational, be calm, 
prove that this is the only way forward? And if it is, in fact, the only way forward, why are you so united against other countries getting the same weapons? Why does North Korea use the same language as France in defending its, its decision to get nuclear weapons? You know, be a calm, rational actor in this field and not the hysterical nuclear armed countries that we've come to know. It seems that this program, the Treaty for the Prevention of Nuclear War and the countries that sign on to it would really signify a grassroots erosion of the ability of the nuclear industry to operate unimpeded. In other words, putting perhaps, if not a block in the road, a stone in the shoe, that they can't move forward as they planned on it. And here in the U.S., we are starting to see some changes, at least on the state and the local level. In January, a bill was introduced in the Massachusetts state legislature that would require the state's pension funds to divest from nuclear manufacturers. The city of Cambridge has already done so, and here in California, Ojai will not make any future investments in the makers or funders of nuclear weapons. Do you think that the best way for us to proceed is to work on the local grassroots level rather than going for the big guys in Washington, D.C. or the heads of whatever countries, people listening to this show in 123 countries that listen to it, um, not going after the top of the governmental food chain, but starting local is the path we need to follow? Well, I think it depends on where people are. So in the U.S., you know, one out of every eight Americans lives in California. So when the California state legislature passes a resolution calling on the U.S. federal government to endorse and embrace the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, that is significant. And that is a demonstration of the will of the people. Nuclear weapons are the opposite of democracy. They are the opposite of people's movements. And it's going to take people's movements being creative in the locations they are to get change. We just had today, which said Berlin, both the city of Berlin, as well as the federal state of Berlin, come on board and call on the German government to join this treaty. Oh, that's fabulous. I hadn't gotten that news yet. Yeah, and, and it's happening every day. There are new cities joining. There are new, there's new state resolutions being discussed. There are conversations happening. And the key thing is, nuclear weapons are an anachronism, and we can move past them, but we have to talk about them. And we have to talk about them not just with our friends that it's comfortable to talk about them with. We have to talk about them in other places. And reach out because I'll tell you, we ran a petition campaign a couple of years ago in the Netherlands. And what we found is that nine out of every 10 people we asked said, of course, we don't support nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are dumb. Wait, they're still a problem? I thought they were gone. Most people don't know. And as soon as they know, they think, oh, my gosh, this is ridiculous. This is a problem of the 80s. Let's let's send it to the dustbin of history. That attitude and that emphasis and that enthusiasm is starting to catch like a wildfire throughout the world. And it will change the minds of those sitting in the high political offices. If you are friends with the head of state, by all means, call your buddy and tell them to get on board with this treaty. If, however, you are not friends with the head of state, think about other ways you can, you can help support this, this effort to make nuclear weapons history. That brings us to the practicalities. What are things that people on the ground can do and what tools do you have? Because the research is extensive and it is impeccable. Everything is footnoted. Everything is accurate in it because we can't, our side can't afford to make mistakes. What do you have available that we can use to support anything that we are saying or doing on the ground? Well, the first thing I would encourage your listeners to just sign up to our newsletter. We're constantly putting information out. It's at nuclearban.org. And there's tons of info there. Now, it depends, again, where people are. If you want to figure out how to make sure your personal finances are in no way connected to the companies that produce nuclear weapons, whether it be through your bank or through your pension investment or other things, um, we have checklists on our website for people to use. We just you know, quickly make, scan the website, see if your bank's listed, 
send them a message. We have tools. You can directly send your bank a message. And a lot of people these days, myself included, use um, do banking on our phones, right? Mobile banking is, is like the thing. And I encourage people all the time, pull out your phone, go to your banking app, and just send a message directly to your bank right now. And just say, hey, are we in any way connected to companies that produce nuclear bombs? When you ask that question through your mobile app, through walking into your local bank branch, whatever it is, you're starting a chain reaction of the good kind. The person on the other end probably has no idea. So they're going to have to ask somebody, is going to have to ask somebody, is going to have to ask somebody. We saw a number of financial institutions get out of the, this type of investment because people started asking questions on their Facebook profiles. And there's this like, oh, that's not good. We can't have this. Oh, wait, wait, let's check. Let's check. <gasps> okay, well, let's get that. They, they divested first and then they put into place a policy to make sure that they'll never have any kind of investments and in, connected to nuclear weapon producers in the future. And it's part of their internal due diligence now. It wasn't a huge number of people that did this. It was three or four people that saw something in the newspaper, that saw a tweet, that heard something on the radio. And they took action because it truly is, as Margaret Mead said, it truly is a small handful of thoughtful and committed people that can change the world. And there are many people who would love the extra energy and attention. And the quick question, do we have anything to do with the nuclear bomb? If so, how can we avoid it? And we can, and we will. The brilliance of this program is that any individual can make an enormous difference simply by taking a few steps that are already brilliantly strategized and plotted out and framed as you have done, as the people with PACs have done, and I can as well. If you have any final thoughts to share with the listeners today, what would that be? I would ask your listeners to tell a friend. Each one can reach one and each one can teach one. And that is how we will get this change. And that is how we will be able to retire from working on nuclear weapon issues and put our energy into dealing with the new challenges that face a new century. Susie Snyder, you have been doing brilliant work I've been aware of your work since Helen Caldicott's conference. I believe it was five or six years ago. And the progress has been astonishing and breathtaking. I always report on any positive steps that we find out that have been taken by either PAX or ICANN on Nuclear Hot Seat, because we've got to get our new good news from somewhere. And it seems to come inordinately from these two groups. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. It's always a great pleasure. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity today. And I appreciate you being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Susie Snyder of PAX Netherlands and Don't Bank on the Bomb. I love this woman's energy. We will have a link up to her website, don'tbankonthebomb.com, on our website, NuclearHotSeat.com under this episode number 454. You can download the 2018 Global Report on the Financing of Nuclear Weapons Producers. The 2019 report will be out shortly, but realize that the information doesn't change. It's still the same offenders, just the numbers might be a little bit different. So take a look and make certain you send it to your bank, your credit union, your pension fund, your financial advisors. It can really make a difference. Activists, Activists, shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. An update on the Cascadia Uranium Film Arts Festival, Living in a Nuclear Landscape, which will run Friday, April 3rd through Sunday, April 5 in Portland, Oregon at Alberta Alley. The organizers would like you to know that this festival is not affiliated with, but has been inspired by, the International Uranium Film Festival. There is no intention of co-opting in any way the work done by the International Uranium Film Festival. A heads up for Facebook users that Nuclear Hot Seat is changing its Facebook presence. For the longest time, we have had two Facebook presences, Nuclear Hot Seat 
and Nuclear Hot Seat Weekly Podcast. This is to let you know that we're consolidating the work, and as of the end of March, we will be closing out the weekly podcast page. Just part of the consolidation and the reorganization we're doing here in connection with the new website. So if you've been relying on the weekly podcast page, please change over to Nuclear Hot Seat and you'll get all the same information there, only everybody will be in the same place at the same time. Makes my life easier as well. Now, next week, for the ninth anniversary of the start of the Fukushima Triple Meltdown Nuclear Disaster, we will be presenting our annual Voices from Japan episode. This year, it's an exclusive interview with journalist Takeshi Yamakawa of Tokyo Shimbun. He's been covering Fukushima since immediately after the earthquake on March 11, 2011, and shares not only what it was like in those early days, but what's going on now. We will also have further updates about the Radioactive Tokyo 2020 Olympics, the Olympic torch relay, which is still slated to start in Fukushima on March 26th, and what impact the coronavirus might be having on either or both of these Olympic events. That's next week on Nuclear Hot Seat number 455, Voices from Japan, the Fukushima Anniversary Edition. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020. Material for this week's show has been researched and compiled from nuclear-news.net, deunrenard.wordpress.com, beyondnuclearinternational.com, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN, don'tbankonthebomb.com, japantimes.co.jp, asahi.com, apjj.org, cbc.ca, thejakartapost.com, newscotland.news, theferret.scot, news.un.org, power-technology.com, physicsworld.com, Public Watchdogs, nwpb.org, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, the London Economic.com, and listeners around the world who keep Nuclear Hot Seat informed as to what the nuclear situation looks like up close and personal from their perspective. A reminder that Nuclear Hot Seat is available on all your favorite podcast platforms, and if you wish to get it by email every week, it's easy. Go to our website, NuclearHotSeat.com, and look for the yellow opt-in box. Put in your first name, put in your email address, Shazam! You will get the link every week as an email, along with a short summary of what the other information is within the episode. As always, if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. And if you appreciate weekly verifiable news updates about nuclear issues around the world, take a moment to look for that big red button at NuclearHotSeat.com, follow through, a donation would be really appreciated. We're always grateful for your support. This episode of Nuclear Hot Seat is copyright 2020, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that you can't protect yourself against nuclear dangers if you don't know what they are. Knowledge is power. Keep listening. There you go. You have just had your nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.